Happy Sunday, everybody. Hope you're doing well. I just returned home late last night from spending an entire week in Memphis, Tennessee, a city I had neither been to before nor hoped to ever return to visit. Um, it was interesting. Uh, and while there, I was there for two different conferences back to back. Um, there were a number of people who uh, came up and said, hey, I really enjoy your your Sunday, you know, podcast thing that you do. And uh, none of the people who said this are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, they're not members of our faith. Uh, and yet they uh, indicated that they uh, derived some kind of uh, curiosity or enjoyment or uh, uh, education from the podcast. So, and of course, I, I feel like I'm talking to members of my own church and probably at least 80, maybe 90, maybe 95 percent, you know, who knows. Uh, but uh, I, I always I'm trying to figure out, right, when I talk about inside baseball kind of stuff, do I do I give these like beginner remarks so that those, you know, who aren't who are listening, but who aren't members of our church can understand what we're talking about? Or do I just continue to use inside baseball terms, assuming that I'm talking to a majority of Mormons? Uh, so I don't really know, uh, uh, you know, quite how to do that. Sometimes I've, I've been more explanatory and then I'll get some feedback like, Hey, you know, you shouldn't waste time talking about that stuff. And then anyway, so it's kind of fun to, to know though, that, uh, that there are, are uh, members, not of our faith, folks, not of our faith who uh, are listening and enjoying. So those conversations prompted this idea for today's musing, which was uh, kind of going over some powerful Mormon doctrines that I think sometimes even we members of the, the LDS church might take for granted or, or they just feel kind of normal because we were raised in the church and we don't really understand how distinct, distinctive, uh, how powerful these are compared to what other folks from other religions uh, believe. So I'm just going to go through and share seven examples with some scriptures and quotes to give a little bit of context to each of these doctrines so that we can better understand and appreciate the, the, the powerful and, and important nature of each of these doctrines. So the first one is eternal families. So in our faith, right, we believe that uh, families have the potential to be eternal, uh, that our husbands and wives and our children, we can be reunited uh, after death. Not in this just very informal sense of like, we'll all be in heaven, but that the family structure can be preserved, that our, our relationships and those dynamics can continue after death in a very literal sense. Um, and so this kind of stems back from 1843. Joseph Smith was uh, in Illinois and he was staying at the home of the Johnsons, Benjamin and Melissa, and he taught them there about the principle of eternal marriage. And some of the, the instructions that he gave to that family, this is the first uh, kind of recorded uh, instance here, uh, some of those instructions are recorded in what is now Doctrine and Covenants section 131, um, which <laughs> here's the beginner part. For those who don't know, that's a, a kind of compilation of modern revelations that God has continued to give uh, after the Bible. So Doctrine and Covenants 131, it says this, uh, in the this is verses one through four in the celestial glory, there are three heavens or degrees, so we believe in a, a kind of stratosphere or stratified uh, heaven, not just heaven and hell. In fact, the Mormon definition of hell is quite different and uh, and hardly anyone will go there basically uh, more called outer darkness, and heaven is this very expansive term we 'll get in a little bit to some of the other distinctive beliefs about heaven um, that uh, that we have. But this says there are three heavens or degrees, and in order to obtain the highest, a man must enter into this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And if he does not, he cannot obtain it. He may enter into other kingdoms, lesser kingdoms, but that is the end of his kingdom. He cannot have an increase. And, and part of what uh, an increase uh, implies, as we'll talk about a little bit later, is, be, uh, is, is spiritual offspring, much like heavenly fa we are the spiritual offspring of Heavenly Father. So the ability to have an increase to your kind of glory and dominions and power and everything. Uh, but eternal marriage is required for the, the kind of highest uh, level of heaven, to, because the whole point of our mortal probation is for us to become like God, for us to learn how to 
follow God's footsteps and be perfect like God. Um, you know, Joseph Smith, he also taught, this is in uh, DNC 130, section 130, that same sociality which exists among us here, the relationships, sociality, social structures, the same that exists among us here will exist among us in heaven, only it will be coupled with eternal glory. So the, the family structure can be preserved. This is something that uh, I think is completely unique to uh, to our faith, not this just generic version of heaven, this atomized version of heaven where we're all just children of God, but there's no uh, form or 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 uh, cohesion of relationships beyond just everyone being, you know, God's children. Uh, but that in our faith, we, we believe that marriage is ordained, you know, between God and um, between a man and a woman is ordained of God. And that this is of eternal import, that God is trying to build this chain of family relationships, not just this temporary marital thing on earth. And then whoop, you're, you're over, you know, that's all done. Um, so in the 18, in, in 1830, the Book of Mormon, this is in Helaman chapter 10, um, it refers to a power that whatsoever ye shall seal on earth shall be sealed in heaven. So talking about the sealing power, the ability to, to dictate here on earth, hey, I'm sealing you together, and then that has heavenly, uh, heavenly implications. The next year, Joseph Smith uh, taught that the order of the high priesthood is that they have power given them to seal up the saints unto eternal life. So this sealing power was very important to be able to kind of order how things are going to be uh, in heaven. And then uh, this sealing power is really the, the culmination of what uh, the prophet Moroni said in a revelation to Joseph in 1823. Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall plant in the hearts of the children. The promise is made to this. He's quoting Isaiah here, or is it Malachi? Um, and the hearts of the children shall turn to the fathers. Yeah, that's Malachi, right? Thirteen years later, Elijah conveyed this authority to Joseph. So Moroni said, hey... God is going to send Elijah to create this, this, you know, provide you this power. 13 years later, here comes uh, the prophet Elijah to do just that, announcing that the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands. And by this, you may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors. So then Joseph, in explaining this, this is in section 128. He says that the earth will be smitten with a curse unless there is a welding link between the fathers and the children. So he's, this is the coming from Malachi in the Old Testament. For we without them cannot be made perfect, neither can they without us be made perfect. Uh, meaning our, our ancestors, basically, our fathers, grandfathers, you know, and so forth. Neither uh, can they nor we be made perfect without those who have died in the gospel also. For it is necessary in the ushering in of the dispensation of the fullness of times that a whole and complete and perfect union and welding together of dispensations and keys and powers and glories should take place and be revealed from the days of Adam even to the present time. So this grand vision of using the sealing power to bind us all together in this family chain of, of cohesive relationships that can have this heavenly guarantee uh, of, of continuing in the future. So eternal families, um, powerful doctrine number one. Uh, number two, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about eternal progression. The idea that heaven is uh, not completely final and uh, you either win or you lose. You go to heaven or, or hell. You are good or bad. You know, there's a judgment and then that's where you're stuck for the eternities. But that for Latter-day Saints, there exists this concept of, uh, of eternal progression. That God has in fact provided a means whereby post-mortal progress can exist, which no one else talks about this to my knowledge, right? I so certainly not. There might be other like non-Christian uh, religious traditions that I'm less familiar with that might uh, have something to do with some, one of these. I don't know. But in the Christian tradition, you know, this is completely unique. So um, here's Joseph. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. It is the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God and to know that we may converse with him as one man converse with another and that he was once a man like us. 
Yea, that God himself, the Father of us all, dwelt on an earth, the same as Jesus Christ himself did. And so from this teaching, we get the quote from Lorenzo Snow that many have heard of, as man now is, God once was, as God now is, man may be. Uh, in section 130 of the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph taught that whatever principle of intelligence we attain unto in this life, it will rise with us in the resurrection. And if a person gains more knowledge and intelligence in this life through his diligence and obedience than another, he will have so much the advantage in the world to come. And so the, this kind of ability to extend the uh, intelligence and knowledge uh, into heaven. In section 81, it says, And if thou art faithful unto the end, thou shalt have a crown of immortality and eternal life in the mansions which I have prepared in the house of my father. And so from this, we get some differing interpretations among uh, uh, leaders of the modern church. There are quite a number of them who, who believe and argue that the opportunity will exist for progression between kingdoms. Because again, we believe in this kind of stratified heaven where depending on your um, your righteousness, there will be different degrees and that even the lowest degree of heaven will be more spectacular than you know anything we now exist. Um, and so there's these different degrees. And But the question is, can you move from one to the other? Or at the time of judgment, are you forever consigned to the one that you were, you know, uh, sent to. So there's a difference of opinion here. There are many leaders of the church who emphatically argue that uh, progress between kingdoms is possible, and there are others who say there aren't. For example, James Talmadge. He says, advancement from grade to grade within any kingdom and from kingdom to kingdom will be provided for. Eternity is progressive. Not in the modern political sense of the term, but just that there, there is progress, potential for progress in eternity. Um, and then Talmadge later said that no one will be held back in the lower kingdoms longer than is necessary to bring him to a fitness for something better. When he reaches that stage, the prison doors will open and there will be rejoicing among the hosts who welcome him into a better state. Now, the Joseph Fielding Smiths of the world and the Bruce McConkies and others, right? These guys were, uh, and, and many modern leaders have, have said things against this concept of inter-kingdom progress uh, potential. Uh, Elder McConkie once called this concept one of the seven deadly heresies, despite many other leaders of the church emphatically teaching it. W.W. Uh, w. Phelps, in his hymn, uh, If You Could Hide a Kolob, which I'm kind of curious to see with uh, the church doing the new hymnal and, and you know, making a bunch of changes. I'm curious to see if, if this will land in there as an approved hymn or whatever. But in, in, uh, in, if you could hide a collab, it says, No man has found pure space, nor seen the outside curtains where nothing has a place. The works of God continue, and worlds and lives abound. Improvement and progression have one eternal round. And so even from the earliest days, you know, the associates of Joseph hearing these uh, revelations and, and uh, Joseph himself talking about uh, the ability to become like God, right? They were believing and teaching that, uh, that this progress is possible. Let's go to Joseph himself. He says, when you climb up a ladder, you must begin at the bottom and ascend step by step until you arrive at the top. And so it is with the principles of the gospel. You must begin with the first and go on until you learn all the principles of exaltation. But it will be a great while after you have passed through the veil, in other words, after you've died, before you will have learned them. It is not at all to be comprehended in this world. It will be a great work to learn our salvation and exaltation even beyond the grave. There's very clear uh, teaching on post-mortal progress and continued learning of the principles of the gospel. Uh, Joseph also said, you've got to learn how to be gods yourselves, to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done. 
by going from a small degree to another, from grace to grace, from exaltation to exaltation, until you are able to sit in glory as do those who sit enthroned in everlasting power. So, so progress, whether we're talking inter-kingdom progress or as we'll talk about now with this third uh, powerful doctrine, the redemption of the dead, right? That the whole uh, um, uh, concept of redemption of the dead implies the ability to change your heart and mind and, uh, and have some measure of progress of some form or fashion uh, after death. So let's get into that. Number three, redemption of the dead. So after Jesus was crucified, uh, but before his resurrection, so in the time between his death and his resurrection, the Savior preached the gospel to the righteous spirits in the spirit world, uh, people who are kind of, uh, you know, waiting for the day of final judgment, right? So kind of a, 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 you know, a period of like a holding pattern before their uh, judgment happens and, and they get their kingdoms. And so Jesus goes to the people in the spirit world, the righteous uh, people, um, and this comes from a variety of sources. And the Bible comes from 1 Peter 3, where it says, Christ also hath, suffered once, uh, hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So this, this is in the New Testament saying, hey, God went and preached to these souls, um, uh, you know, before he was resurrected. In Doctrine and Covenants 138, uh, it gives a little bit more color, which is, you know, the benefit we have of modern revelation. So this says... Uh, while in while this vast multitude waited and conversed, rejoicing in the hour of their deliverance from the chains of death, talking about the, the spirits in the spirit world, the Son of God appeared, declaring liberty to the captives who had been faithful. I'm in verse 18. And there he preached to them the everlasting gospel, the doctrine of the resurrection and the redemption of, the de of mankind from the fall and from individual sins on conditions of repentance. But unto the wicked he did not go. And among the ungodly and the unrepented who had defiled themselves while in the flesh, his voice was not raised. Neither did the rebellious who rejected the testimonies and warnings of the ancient prophets behold his presence, nor look upon his face. But his ministry among those who were dead was limited to the brief time intervening between the crucifixion and the resurrection. And then it says, uh, I wondered, this is, uh, I believe, Joseph uh, talking about how he's learning this through Revelation. He says, I wondered at the words of Peter, where he said that the Son of God preached unto the spirits of prison, who sometimes were disobedient, and how it was possible for him to preach to those spirits and perform the necessary labor among them in so short a time. Right? Because it was like the equivalent of, of like 36 hours or so, you know, it was, it was three days, but but... The way these Jews counted their days, you know, 6 p.m. and so forth, it wasn't like, uh, you know, 72 full hours. So he's saying, how could this have happened in so short a period of time? And as I wondered, my eyes were opened and my understanding quickened. And I perceived that the Lord went not in person among the wicked and the disobedient who had rejected the truth to teach them. But behold, from among the righteous, he organized his forces and appointed messengers clothed with power and authority and commissioned them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them that were in darkness, even to all the spirits of men. And thus was the gospel preached to the dead. So this gets back to the second doctrine uh, mentioned about eternal progress. Here's all these people who never heard of the gospel or were wicked or, you know, whatever. And uh, they are not, um, they have not been baptized, you know, by proper authority and, and so forth. And so Jesus goes to organize a missionary force and, and tasking uh, appointed messengers and giving them authority to set up this system to go preach to all these people so that they could have their progress and so that they could be redeemed uh, despite being dead. Of course, if you want to enter the celestial kingdom, the topmost kingdom of heaven, you have to receive uh, essential ordinances of the gospel. This comes from section 131, which we read earlier. Uh, also, here's from section 138. It says, the dead who repent will be redeemed through obedience to the ordinances of the house of God, right? God's commandment that everyone has to be baptized means that uh, there has to be a process by which they can uh, obtain that baptism. 
And just like the sealing power we mentioned earlier for marriage, there are other priesthood powers where the ordinances are valid both here and in the spirit world. Um, so here's from DNC. This is 128. Again, these are all modern revelations. It says that now the nature of this ordinance consists in the power of the priesthood by the revelation of Jesus Christ, where it's granted that whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Or in other words, taking a different view of the translation, whatever you record on earth shall be recorded in heaven and so forth. Um, whether they themselves have attended to the ordinances. In other words, like if I'm baptized, you know, for myself, um, or let's see in, in their own propia persona, like, yeah, my, my own body or by the means of their own agents, according to the ordinance, which God has prepared for their salvation. It may seem to some to be a very bold doctrine that we talk of a power which records or binds on earth and binds in heaven. Nevertheless, in all ages of the world, whenever the Lord has given a dispensation of the priesthood to any man by actual revelation or any set of men, this power has always been given. Hence, whatsoever those men did in authority in the name of the Lord and did it truly and faithfully and kept a proper and faithful record of the same, it became a law on earth and in heaven and could not be annulled according to the degrees of the great Jehovah. Um, I mean, Matthew 16 talks about, I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So this is something, as, as Joseph was just saying, that the Lord has always done. And it was done in New Testament times and before. So then, of course, what are the ordinances? Well, among them, as we said earlier, the Lord has commanded that everyone has to be baptized. So, so uh, kind of, you know, Christians out there in general believe in a very spiteful God who condemns to hell uh, individuals who uh, were not baptized before they died. Like, oh, shucks, uh, you know, uh, too bad for you. Um, you live in some random other country where, you know, missionaries never came or you never heard about the gospel or, you know, your child died before they could get baptized. And, and that's a, that's a, a model built on, I don't know, uh, just a, a punitive approach to redemption that like, it is like gambling. Like if you're lucky enough to have been born in the right place at the right time, and fortunate enough to be among the elite who heard of the gospel and were near geographically uh, near a a minister with the proper authority who could baptize you. Like that's, I, I don't believe in a God who gambles with the lives of his children who he loves. Like that doesn't make any sense. That's a, it's a very spiteful God. We'll we'll talk in a moment uh, uh, about the nature of God. That's the fourth one, and and this relates to it that so many people don't understand the nature of God. They believe in this punitive God. They believe in this uh, God without you know parts or passions and and so forth. And so they just don't understand. But but the Lord has provided for a way whereby all of these people can be baptized. This very expansive view of redemption, where it doesn't matter where you lived or when you lived or who you lived near. And if you happen to be close to someone with authority to get baptized, none of that matters because everyone is going to have the opportunity to accept the ordinance of baptism. First Corinthians 15, we talked about this on a past musing else. What shall they do? Which are baptized for the dead. If the dead not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? This, this clear, you know, belief in new Testament times of like, well, of course, we're going to rise from the dead. Of course, there's a resurrection because we're baptizing people for the dead. There's these ordinances we're officiating for people who have already been deceased. And back to DNC 128, it says, um, I stated to you in my letter before I left that I would write to you to give you information about many subjects. So now I'm going to resume talking about baptism for the dead. As that subject seems to occupy my mind and press itself upon my feelings. You may think this order of things, again, baptism for the dead, to be very particular, but let me tell you that it is only to answer the will of God by conforming to the ordinance and preparation that the Lord ordained and prepared before the foundation of the world for the salvation of the dead who should die without a knowledge of the gospel. Okay, so redemption of the dead, right? The, uh, the priesthood authority, the ordinances, the power to bind and, uh, and record uh, on earth, to impact what's happening in heaven, this expansive, um, loving uh, approach to 
Christ's atonement and redemption that allows everybody to have a chance, that allows all of God's children to be redeemed, that does not condemn anyone to hell because they, you know, uh, they, they, they lost out in where they were born and when they were born or any of that kind of stuff, that God wants all his children redeemed and has provided a means through vicarious ordinances where I can get baptized on behalf of my great, 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 great grandpa, right? Or whatever. And that he in the spirit world where Christ went to go preach and created a missionary force to go, you know, uh, preach the gospel to all these other spirits where those people can have the opportunity to accept the baptism that was done on their behalf, baptism for the dead, and, and thereby fulfill God's commandment that everyone has to be baptized, that, that God has allowed this kind of uh, proxy uh, opportunity, recognizing that very, 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 very few people on earth would have the physical, literal opportunity to be baptized. All right, number four, uh, four nature of God. I teased this just a moment ago. Joseph Smith, again, it is the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God. He was once a man like us. God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth, the same as Jesus Christ himself did. And, and Joseph and his associates, they had, uh, remember like the school of the prophets, they were basically like a theological seminary where they were talking about deep doctrinal issues, which, you know, the gospel doctrine classes we sit in today, I, I feel like, oh man, why can't we <laughs> have like, uh, something like that that's more uh, meaty and substantive. And and out of those lessons came a document called the Lectures on Faith. Uh, I'm going to separately do a musing at some point about uh, the Lectures of Faith and how they were uh, included in the Doctrine and Covenants for quite a long time until they were purged and how that happened and why and all the things. But le Lectures on Faith were of, of deep doctrinal significance for the early Latter-day Saints. And in the third lecture, they said... Uh, let us observe that three things are necessary in order that any rational and intelligent being may exercise faith in God unto life and salvation. So three things. Number one, the idea that God actually exists. Number two, a correct, they italicize, correct idea of his character, perfections, and attributes. In other words, to exercise faith in God, you need to have a correct understanding of the nature of God, his attributes, his character. Thirdly, a knowledge that the course of life which one is pursuing is according to his will. Uh, without these three important facts, they said, the faith of every rational being must be imperfect and unproductive. And so the importance of understanding the true uh, nature of God. Uh, section 130 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Father had a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. The Son, Jesus, also. So this is powerful in the sense that it, it, it literally recognizes that God is our heavenly Father. That we are, uh, and we're actually going to get into, um, these are good segues. We're about to go into the, uh, the next doctrine, which relates quite a bit, uh, which is our co-eternality um, with God. That we are, uh, we are quite like God and, and have that potential. So here in talking about the nature of God, he's not some mystical force without parts or passions, and he's not everywhere and nowhere and everything all at the same time and any of this kind of hippy-dippy mystical stuff, right? Like he has flesh and bone, that he once was a man. This is something mind-blowing to most Christians who, uh, confined to the Bible, cannot fathom uh, a, a God that has this specific type of definition about him, this, these attributes. Uh, it's completely foreign to most Christians, and therefore they reject it. They say it's non-biblical, which, you know, we concede is true. We'll get in a moment uh, to another powerful doctrine, which is additional revelation and an open canon to better understand truth. And so they say it's not biblical, and that's not what God is, and, and the Bible says, like, hardly anything, if anything, <laughs> about the, the nature of God, which is why you know, hundreds of years after Christ, all these councils and debates and things, they kind of just came up with these creeds and, and these documents. Um, and, 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 you know, totally uh, missed the forest for the trees or whatever, right? They don't, they don't get it right. Uh, and, but yet modern Christianity is built upon these, these mortal men debating the attributes of God and coming up with these creeds. 
and uh, and people are you know it's like it says in D and C whatever one twenty three that there are many uh, who you know don't know where the truth is because they don't know where to find it. They've been deceived by the subtle craftiness of men, wherein they lie in wait to deceive. So there are a lot of people who just don't know because they have blinders on with uh, being confined to a limited amount of of knowledge. So the nature of God, that that God um, has flesh and bone, that he's not some just mystical force or whatever, but that he is in a literal sense, our heavenly father. I mean, I could throw on this list too the heavenly mother uh, doctrine, uh, that there exists such a thing. Already did amusing a couple weeks ago, I think on that. Um, so we won't talk about that here only to say that like they are actual parents of our spirits. We are children in a literal sense. We are brothers and sisters in a literal, uh, spiritual sense. And that's a very distinctive Mormon belief as well. Okay. Number five, again, teased it earlier, the co-eternality of man with God. And what I'm referring to more particularly here is the pre-existence. Uh, and what that really just means is our, <laughs> it's actually the wrong term because it's not before you existed. That's meant to, to refer to pre, uh, pre mortal existence, like before we existed here on earth, but we existed for a long time. And again, here's the Bible largely, uh, almost entirely silent on this. People just thinking, Oh, I spontaneously emerged and now I'm a, you know, spirit and body together. But, but. Uh, in Latter-day Saint modern revelation, we know that there's so much more. So here's in Abraham 3. Uh, again, kind of modern, uh, modern revelation here. So the Lord had shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences that were organized before the world was. And among all these, there were many of the noble and great ones. And God saw that these souls, they were good. So these existing intelligences, co-equal with God, already existing, God saw that these souls were good. He stood in the midst of them. And he said, these I will make my rulers. For he stood among those that were spirits and he saw, saw that they were good. And he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of them. Thou wast chosen before thou wast born. And there stood one among them that was like unto God. And he said unto those who were with him, we will go down for there is space there. And we will take of these materials and we will make an earth whereon these may dwell. And we will prove them herewith to see if they'll do whatever the Lord their God shall command them. So the, the existence of intelligences, spiritual matter and materials, unique identities, um, long existing uh, before coming down here. That, that basically Heavenly Father and Mother are just, you know, pumping out spiritual children, whatever the actual process is for doing so, who knows. And, uh, and, and, you know, all these spirits uh, are being created and uh, knowing God and interacting with one another and learning and, you know, uh, debating things probably or whatever, right? Just enjoying life until such a time as was ready for the plan to be announced and uh, earth to be formed and uh, the process uh, to start. Doctrine Covenants 93 says, you, ye were also in the beginning with the Father, that which is spirit, even the spirit of truth. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence or the light of truth was not created or made, neither indeed can it be. So this concept of existing spiritual matter, intelligence, potentially the, the raw material from which spiritual children are created, um, existing with the Father, uh, man was in the beginning with God, intelligence was not created or made just fascinating to kind of understand then you get into the chicken and the egg thing of like okay where did this ultimately come from in moses 3 um, every plant of the field before it was in the earth every herb of the field before it grew i the lord created uh, lord god created all things of which i've spoken spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth for i the lord god had not caused it to rain upon the face of the earth and I had created all the children of men and not yet a man to till the ground for in heaven created I them and there was not yet flesh upon the earth, neither in the water, neither in the air. But I spake, uh, I, the Lord God spake, there went up a mist from the earth, watered the whole face of the ground. And I formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life. And man became a living soul, the first flesh upon the earth. The first man also, nevertheless, all things were before created. 
but spiritually were they created and made according to my word. So again, this pre-mortal existence that everything was first created uh, uh, this, this, uh, spiritually and then God created physically. And so this concept of this long-standing relationship with and, and, and uh, learning from and being around God way before we were ever born. Um, you know, Joseph said, uh, God himself, finding he was in the midst of spirits and glory, saw proper to institute laws whereby the rest could have a privilege to advance like himself. He says, we came to this earth that we might have a body and present it pure before God in the celestial kingdom. The great principle of happiness consists of having a body. So again, God having a body of flesh and bone, the, the, the power and, and opportunities, I guess, that emerge from having a body with these godly powers um, and not just being spirit alone. Um, here's a quote from Terrell Givens I enjoyed. He's an a LDS theologian and author. He says, As pre-mortal intelligences, we were independent in our sphere, possessing agency. In heavenly councils, we accepted the generous invitation to embark on a journey, a process that could ultimately make us one with our heavenly parents. We could grow to be like them. They desired to make of us peers, not subjects. In that sense, at one meant atonement, at one meant is the goal, the end of all our striving and has been from the beginning. As children of divine parents, we agreed to use our agency in ways consistent with their guidance and direction. So the whole point was becoming co-equal with God, using our agency to say, hey, I support you, right? This is Jeremiah back in the day, right? T or God telling Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, right? I knew you, like you pre-existed. And so the, the seeds of these concepts were there in the Bible. It's just that uh, Christians do not really latch onto this and they, they lack information. So it's just all speculation without the benefit of, of additional revelation. Okay, number six, uh, the depth of Christ's atonement. Uh, added understanding about how the atonement works and what it implies um, and its consequences that we have through uh, modern revelation. Uh, the Book of Mormon, Alma 7, talking about how Jesus suffered pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, not just that he was suffering sin for our sins, as is a common kind of conventional understanding, but our pains, our afflictions, our temptations. Uh, it says he will take upon them their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their uh, infirmities. It says he would take on, in 2 Nephi 9, take on the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children who belong to the family of, uh, of Adam. And so this doctrine that we can become Christ-like through the atonement because of the atonement is, is often considered blasphemous by, you know, a lot of Christians, even though it's taught in the Bible, right? I mean, again, in, in limited respects. But the whole point was to take a mortal individual with all their weaknesses, with all their imperfections, and convert those weaknesses and strengths into strengths to help us overcome, to help us become whole, um, you know, Moses 139 talks about how these godlike god -like attributes are so uh, important to God. Uh, so the Book of Mormon uh, and King Benjamin clarifies this doctrine that, that again, like the Bible is, is murky on at best, which has created so much confusion. King Benjamin, in his uh, final sermon, he says that there's this need to put off the natural man and become a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. In other words, the whole purpose of the atonement is to become saintly. It is to become like God. It is this progressive experience where God wants to elevate us to his level. Like Terrell Given says, uh, not as subjects, but as peers, which is why the, the kind of kingly uh, terminology that's so often used with God, I think is incomplete and perhaps very tainted by our kind of mortal uh, uh, institutions of authority whereby people try to rule over one another, right? And we have this concept of, of kings, and so uh, we equate God as the king, but God is not like any other king, right? And he's, he doesn't want to keep us as subjects. He wants to lift us up to become kings and queens of our own kingdoms and have the same potential that he had, which begs the question of if there's a God before the current God and 
the hierarchy of gods and stuff, which I may or may not do a, a musing on. It. I've, I've got it on the list of things to, to do in the future. Um, okay, finally, on, on this uh, doctrine of the atonement, I really love uh, section 45. Uh, in the first few verses, there's, um, um, or, there's this portion dealing with the atonement that I've always really enjoyed this visualization, you might say. So verses 3 through 5. Uh, he's t Jesus is talking to us and he says, listen to him who is the advocate with the father. An advocate is someone who is arguing on your behalf, like almost like a lawyer defending you and helping you, right? Listen to him, Jesus, who is the advocate with the father, who is pleading your cause before him saying, father, heavenly father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin, Jesus in whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy son which was shed, the blood of him whom thou gavest that thyself might be glorified. Wherefore, Father, after looking at Jesus and focusing on Jesus' atonement, wherefore, Father, spare these my brethren that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. What, what is awesome about modern revelation is that it fills in with such vivid color the power and depth of Christ's atonement. That yes, the crucifixion has its, uh, has its purpose and its role and its impact, but that the suffering uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane and taking on the pains and the infirmities and the afflictions and everything else so that Christ could know how to succor us creates this very like warm, comforting uh, uh, perspective on God that he gets it in the deepest sense and can be there for us in the most intimate and, and awkward and uncomfortable and unrelatable of circumstances. Um, just the, 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 the color that we have through modern revelation of the atonement, I think makes it far easier to leverage the atonement and understand uh, what Jesus actually did, which leads us to the seventh and final uh, powerful Mormon doctrine. Um, and that is modern revelation that we Latter-day Saints do not believe in a closed canon, a closed set of scripture. Uh, I found this quote online from a Christian author, not a member of our particular faith, uh, where he was talking about the challenge that a lot of Christians have when it comes to the Bible. He says, it's possible to stress the Bible so much and give it so central a place that the sensitive Christian conscience must rebel. We may illustrate such overstress on the Bible by the often used and perhaps misused quotation from Chillingworth, quote, the Bible alone is the religion of Protestantism. And he continues, or we may recall how often it's been said that the Bible is the final authority for the Christian. If it will not seem too facetious, I would like to put in a good word for God. It is God and not the Bible who is the central fact for the Christian. When we speak of the, quote, word of God, we use a phrase which, if properly used, may apply to the Bible, word of God. But it has a deeper primary meaning. It is God who speaks to man. But he does not do so only through the Bible. He speaks through prophets and apostles. He speaks through specific events. And while his unique message to the church finds its central record and written expression in the Bible, this very reference to the Bible reminds us that Christ is the word of God in a living personal way which surpasses what we have even what we have even in this unique book even the bible proves to be the word of God only when the holy spirit working within us attests to the truth and the divine authority of what the scripture says he's wrapping up here he says faith must not give to the aids that God provides the reverence and attention that belong only to God our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, don't put your faith in, in the scriptures. Put your faith in God. He says, our hope is in God. Our life is in Christ. Our power is in the spirit. The Bible speaks to us of the divine center of all life and help and power. But it is not the center. The Christian teaching about the canon must not deify the scripture. I thought that was fascinating. You know, so, so when Christians argue that the canon is closed, that, that the Bible is locked up and that's all of God's revelation, um, it's basically placing God's past written word above God himself. 
Like you're tying God's hands. Because nowhere in the Bible, literally nowhere, does it say that there will be no additional revelation beyond the Bible. Quite the opposite. Jesus, you know, and, and during his mortal ministry, telling others, like, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, and them must also I bring, and so forth. Right? And, uh, and, and the Bible, for what it's worth, was not compiled until after Christ died. It's not like there was some official, like, you know, Bible uh, uh, scribe, you know, doing this single book that everybody had. No. The New Testament was just all these leaflets and letters and things just flying around the New Testament community, the early saints. And, and only later did they start to kind of compile and prioritize and rank and sort and decide, okay, this is going to be the Bible. Bible, la Biblia, just means library, basically. It's a collection of teachings. But at no point did God give a revelation and say, oh, the Bible's done, I'm not going to reveal anything anymore. Which is ironic, because if Christ were to ever have given that revelation, you know, after his mortal ministry, to say the apostles or someone else, that would have been a, a post-biblical revelation, Right? Which implies that there is no closed canon, and there can't be, because you would need God to tell you that there's a closed canon, which would mean that God can continue to speak to man. And, uh, you know, God, God called prophets in the past. I mean, throughout history, Old Testament, like, why would he not do so in the future? It's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. Again, there's no revelation on the matter at all. So here's Joseph F. Smith. And yes, I used his middle name because there's a Joseph Smith and a Joseph Fielding Smith. And so with some of these guys, you just gotta. So Joseph F. Smith, he says, Are we to understand then that God does not and will not further make known his will to men? That what he has said suffices? His will to Moses and Isaiah and John is abundant for modern followers of Christ? The Latter-day Saints take issue with this doctrine and pronounce it illogical, inconsistent, and untrue. And bear testimony to all the world that God lives and that he reveals his will to men who believe him and who obey his commandments as much in our day as at any time in the history of nations. The canon of scripture is not full. God has never revealed at any time that he would cease to speak forever to men. If we are permitted to believe that he has spoken, we must and do believe that he continues to speak because he is unchangeable. His will to Abraham did not suffice for Moses. Neither did his will to Moses suffice for Isaiah. Why? Because their different missions required different instructions. And logically, that is also true of the prophets and people of today. A progressive world will never discover all truth until its inhabitants become familiar with all the knowledge of the perfect one. Okay, so to wrap up this point, I'm going to share... From the Book of Mormon, Modern Revelation, Additional Scripture, uh, from 2 Nephi 29 that directly addresses this argument. Powerful set of verses many of you are familiar with. And, and, but it just demolishes this argument. So this is starting in verse 6. Thou fool that shall say, a Bible, we've got a Bible, we need no more Bible. Have ye obtained a Bible, save it were by the Jews? Know ye not that there are more nations than one? Know ye not that I, the Lord your God, have created all men, and that I remember those who are upon the isles of the sea, and that I rule in the heavens above and in the earth beneath, and I bring forth my word unto the children of men, yea, even upon all the nations of the earth? Again, other people, other sheep I have, which are not of this Jerusalem fold. Unto them must I go, unto them must I bring the gospel. So here's God saying, like, I didn't just talk to the people in Jerusalem. <laughs> talk to people on the isles of the sea and nations all over. Wherefore murmur ye? Why do you murmur? Because ye shall receive more of my word. Know ye not that the testimony of two nations is a witness unto you that I am God, that I remember one nation like unto another? Wherefore I speak the same words unto one nation like unto another. And when the two nations shall run together, the testimony of the two nations shall run together also. So we have the Bible, from the Old World, and we have the, the Book of Mormon from the New World, these two records running together also. And I do this, he says, that I may prove unto many that I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that I speak forth my words according to mine own pleasure. In other words, your counsels and creeds cannot close my mouth. You can't decree that the canon is closed. You can't say that I don't talk to men anymore because I'm unchangeable. 
because I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this is what I do. I talk to people and give them direction. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let's see. Wherefore, because you have a Bible, you need not suppose that it contains all my words. Neither need you suppose that I've not caused more to be written. For I command all men, both, both in the east and in the west, in the north, the south, the islands of the sea, that they shall write the words which I speak unto them. For out of the books which shall be written will I judge this world, every man according to their works, according to that which is written. For behold, wrapping up, I shall speak unto the Jews, and they shall write it, the Bible. And I shall speak unto the Nephites, and they shall write it, the Book of Mormon. And I shall also speak unto the other tribes of the house of Israel, which I have led away. And they shall write it. That's a fun topic, the, the lost tribes of Israel. And I shall also speak unto all nations of the earth, and they shall write it. So God's saying, I talk to people all over the world. And then I tell them to write it down. And some of them, I tell them to bury it, you know, the records, and we'll save it for later. And some of them pass it down generation to generation, right? But I tell everyone to write down the revelations, and this is happening all over the world, not just in Jerusalem. Final verse. Verse 13, and it shall come to pass that the Jews shall have the words of the Nephites and the Nephites shall have the words of the Jews. So again, the book of Mormon and the Bible and the Nephites and the Jews shall have the words of the lost tribes of Israel at some future point. And the lost tribes of Israel shall have the words of the Nephites and the Jews. So God is saying, I speak to everyone and I tell them all to write it down, which is scripture. And so this concept of a closed canon is ridiculous because God has literally never taught that. And yet modern Christianity would have us believe that the Bible is the exclusive and final record on the word of God. They're putting words in God's mouth. So the Latter-day Saints say, no, there is modern revelation. God did reveal himself to Joseph Smith, told him that all the other churches were wrong, that they draw near unto me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That they're wandering in their own paths, right? Uh, they've created uh, you know, these images of God that are like man. And so God gives him additional revelation and says, time to teach truth and write this down, which became the doctrine and covenant. So modern revelations, God again saying, here's revelation, write it down. This becomes scripture, additional instruction for your time, your specific uh, circumstances. And, and again, going back to things like the atonement, filling in so much color and depth or the, the pre-mortal existence, how amazing and interesting and comforting it is to know that we're, we have like divine lineage and that we literally have a spirit father and mother and that we can become like God and that there's a chance for progression. There's a chance to be with, with our families for eternity, uh, including those who have died, uh, maybe without being baptized, that they can, you know, progress. They can have ordinances. Like it's just such this expansive, loving view of humanity that is so uh, deeply in contrast with with traditional Christianity that's very condemnatory. It's, it's very punitive. It's like, well, you, you rolled the dice and you lost. Sorry, you know, you're, you're going to hell with eternal flames and death. Like, there's such a limited understanding of these things that the, the concept of heaven and hell and the concept of, uh, of, of all these things that I've discussed is just completely not there. They reject the doctrines outright. They call it non-biblical, not supported by the Bible. Well, you're <laughs> absolutely like that's the whole point right is that god gives additional revelation that he talks to his people throughout time and uh, and we should not close our hearts to uh, and our minds to the opportunity to learn more and to seek additional truth and knowledge um and so fundamentally like that last one is frankly the most important one because without modern revelation all those other things i talked about would really not exist in our faith it's because God revealed them. It's because God said, well, you know, the Bible's kind of murky here. Let me give you additional revelation on this thing. Or Joseph Smith had a question, like, how does this work? And, you know, this, this eternal marriage stuff. And God said, well, here's, here's the relationships and here's the sealing power. And you can go start sealing all these people together and binding on earth. You know, oh, okay, right? And, and so uh, revelation, modern revelation is the basis upon which all this other knowledge has come, which has led to these different powerful doctrines that I've talked about that require us to have access to new revelations from God and not be confined just to things that were revealed to people in one particular location over 2000 years ago. So there you have it. There's lots more, a lot of fun stuff in our, our, uh, in our faith, which I think is awesome. It's so rich. It's so complex. Uh, there's, there's so much color, 
um, and, and I enjoy it. I, I think it's awesome to know that God is still communicating, uh, that that potential for added revelation is there. Um, I might get into on a separate musing a concern I have about uh, uh, a, a potential lack of new revelation in, in recent, uh, shall we say, decades. Uh, but at least, you know, with Joseph Smith getting the keys of the dispensation and, and getting all of these revelations and having this clear power from God just burst forth so much light on these subjects beyond uh, what had existed at the time. And we're still chewing on it. We're still trying to rise to it. We're still condemned for treating these things lightly. We have to repent and remember the new covenant. We have to take advantage of this knowledge and not you know, take it for granted and not act upon it and, and all these things. So it's just, there's lots of color. There's lots of opportunity. It's a rich doctrine. Uh, it's tantalizing intellectually um, and uh, and spiritually uh, as well. So hope that was interesting to you, especially the, the few of you who uh, are not members of our faith uh, to learn something a little bit more deeply about what we believe. Um, it's powerful stuff. It's comforting stuff. It's, it's uh, enticing stuff. And uh, so for anyone who hasn't yet read any of the scriptures I've been talking about, certainly that invitation always exists. Feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to point you in the right direction. But for those of us who already have you know, read those scriptures before and been a member of the church for a long time, it's an invitation to re-engage, uh, to recommit, to, to deepen our understanding, to spend time focusing on, on you know, the core uh, doctrines and deeply understand these things so that we can appreciate them and act upon them. We'll wrap it up there. Have a good uh, week and I'll see you next Sunday.